He is worthy of our praise and so much more. Would you stand with us and let's give it to him today. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see? church sing.
is worthy of all blessing, or honor, and glory. Today we're going to introduce a new song to you. We're going to ask that you remain standing. We're actually going to begin with the chorus so that you can kind of get a feel for it. And then as you are comfortable with the lyrics of the verses, uh, you can join in with us and then sing the chorus with us again. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Since they are many, His mercy is more. What love could remember? No wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins, they would wait as we constantly roam but father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the dead we could never afford and our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the promise. Even though our sins are many, His mercy is more. You may be seated. We're going to share another song based on the Psalm 130. It's a short psalm, but one verse that it says over and over again is, I will wait on the Lord. I will wait and put my hope in His word. 
Out of the depths I cry to you. In darkest places I will call. Incline your ear to me anew. And hear my cry for mercy, Lord. Were you to count my sinful ways, how could I come before your throne? I stand at full forgiveness seat. I stand redeemed by grace alone. I will wait for you, I will wait for you on your word. I will rely, I will wait for you, surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied. Put your hope in God alone. Take courage in His power to say, completely and forever one, by Christ emerging from the grave. God himself has paid the price that all who trust on him today find healing in his sacrifice. That all who trust in him today find healing in his sacrifice. I will wait for you I will wait for you through the storm and through the night. I will wait for you, surely wait for you, for your love is my delight. I will wait for you, I will wait for you through the storm. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you for your word, that it is our delight, Lord, that we can come to you as our salvation, our Messiah, 
our Redeemer, to whom all praise, glory, honor, and blessing is due your name. Lord, may today be a praise offering to you. And all this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. It is a delight, a joy to see you here today. Did you survive the earthquake last night? Did you know we had one? Yeah. Things are getting crazy. Things are getting a little end of time-ish. I'm not one to read my Bible through a newspaper, but certainly... We need to be mindful of the times that we're living in. Life is about transitions. Life is about trials. Some of life's transitions are major, they're big deals, they're highly significant. And it's no revelation, been talking about this for a while, that Eastside Baptist Church finds itself in a major life transition. I've tried to think, relocating. What, what could a church do that would be more significant or major, more of a transition than that? I can't, I'm sure there are out there. I just can't think of any. We're in a big one. And layered on top of this transition are some trials. Actually, significant trials. Global in scope. Global in reach. Layered on top of this is this thing that we call a pandemic. We have been instructed, I believe, by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 to 10, to learn some stuff from the example of the children of Israel who also were in a time of transition, in a time of trial. Big transition, migrating 2 million plus people from a land of enslavement to a land of promise. That's a major transition. Paul, as the Spirit moved him to write, essentially wrote, pay attention to what happened at that time. And learn from their example. Learn to expect certain types of temptations that accompany transitions and trials. So if we are mindful and paying attention to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we've read it and focused on it several weeks, it essentially is pay attention and learn. We noted in our study up to this point, God's People on the Move, which is the title of the series, that when we are in transition, times of temptation will come, that there will be temptations. The temptation to go the way of fear and to derail the way of faith. And we've looked at two temptations thus far. We saw, surprisingly or maybe not, that one of the temptations that surfaces in a time of transition is the temptation to complain. To complain about circumstances, that is a very, very real temptation. The second temptation we examined last week, and that is the temptation to covet. That covetousness is also a real temptation that God's people know it's coming. It will happen. And we are instructed to pay attention and to be on guard when these temptations come. The temptation to complain and the temptation to covet. We saw that the remedy that God has given to us, the spiritual gift to deal with the temptation to complain, is the gift of gratitude. That thankfulness, biblical thankfulness, is God's way of helping us combat and overcome that temptation. And today we're going to see what God's remedy is to the temptation of covetousness. Now, I'm about to ask you to do something that when a preacher does this, there is an inherent risk. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for just a moment. And the risk is that I'm going to need you to open them sometime this morning. 
Okay, you don't want to be that kid that fell asleep on the school bus and stayed asleep until the bus finished its route. You don't want to be asleep until the end of the service, please. Okay, so here we go. Close your eyes and for a moment, picture a place with me. Imagine a place that is more peaceful than any place you've ever known. Life is not perfect in this place, but it is peaceful. You're not in a hurry to do anything. And you are not submerged in the demands of other people. There are houses near yours, but they're not on top of you. You're not living in a mass of humanity. There are no pressures to buy anything, to do anything, or to experience anything. You don't hear the noise of life. You don't hear the traffic hassles or the rush of people. You're not rushing off to appointments. And you don't flinch with revulsion when the phone rings or when you get a text. You got time. Lots of time to do the things you need to do. And time left over to do what you like to do. In this place, there's room to breathe, to walk, to think. You live in a modest home, and your kids may even wear hand-me-downs, but your family's okay. You're happy. Your needs are met. And in your family room, you have a passage of Scripture hung up. It is your family's passage. It's Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9. Give me neither poverty nor wealth. Feed me with the food I need. Otherwise, I might have too much and deny you, God, saying, who is the Lord? Your life is not perfect, but you're okay with that. Since you're trusting in the Lord and taking each day as it comes. If hardships arise, that's okay. They won't sink your ship or they won't derail your family because you planned for this. and You've left room and resources to deal with it. Okay, come back to me now. Come back to me. Packy, come back. Come back. Okay. Everybody pulled their mask up over their eyes. I don't know if you're back with me or not. Does that sound pretty good? Does that sound like a place where you would like to be? What does it? Does it sound like a place where you would want to live your life? I have some good news to share with you this morning. This place is attainable. It's real. It can happen. In fact, I will take it even much further and say, this place is God's will for your life. God wants you to be in this place. The place that I'm describing is a biblical place called contentment. Contentment is the atmosphere of the way of faith. You won't find it on the way of fear. You're going to find covetousness on the way of fear. But on the way of faith, you're going to find contentment. It is the attitude of the promised land where God embraces and prospers all who choose him and the attitudes that please him. Contentment is the place where God wants us to live. And I cannot say that any stronger. And I, I say it on the basis of clear, unequivocal passages of teachings in the Bible. Contentment is a gift to you. It is God's gift to you. And it is a gift that is found in the life of Christ himself. A famous quote from a significant church father, St. Augustine, states this truth well. God has made us for himself. Our hearts will only be contented when they find their rest in him. This morning, I want us to look at a passage of scripture that talks about how to rest in biblical contentment. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to be working on the premise this morning that contentment is God's remedy for covetousness. That is the drive, the passionate lust 
for stuff to satisfy us in place of God. That is covetousness. Contentment is the remedy for that. So in 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6, we read, But godliness with contentment, so there's our key word there, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. Again, our key word, content. Verse 9. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So this morning, in order for us to understand this issue of contentment, we first need to define it. So let me try to give us a simple, somewhat simple definition of when I talk about contentment, what I mean. Contentment is a satisfaction with God and the sufficient provisions he gives. Let me dig down to that again. Contentment is a satisfaction with God and the sufficient provisions he gives. So according to this, satisfaction, you don't need anything else. You're satisfied. You're delighting in what God has entrusted to you. Contentment means to rest in what you already have and nothing more. It means to rest in what you already have and you don't need more. It means I have no fear of the future. Why? Because I'm not worried about being in lack. I'm satisfied with what I have. I have no resentment of what others may have and I don't have. Why? Because I am satisfied in what I have. So I don't mind when someone has something I don't. It is the capacity to sit down in rest and to say, I have enough. It is a settled sense of adequacy in life. It's like a breath of fresh air to someone who is suffocating. It's like a cup of cold water to someone in a desert. Now, in the passage that we just read, in chapter 6, verse 6, we have a pairing at work here. We are told that contentment has a partner, that it comes with something else. Contentment's partner is godliness. And these two go together like a hand in a glove. Godliness deals with our identity in Christ. Who am I? In Christ, it is godliness. That's an issue of identity. Who am I? Contentment deals with what I have in Christ. What have I been given in Christ? So contentment deals with possessions, what we have in Christ. Godliness deals with identity. Who am I in Christ? And we are told these things go together. And they come together with a promise that when we put godliness with contentment together, the promise is great gain. It says it right there. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, Paul is not condemning the desire for gain. Deep within us is a God-giving desire for betterment. To make ourselves better. Down in the secret places of who we are, Almighty God has given us a desire to be better and to have a better life. So I, I want to be clear. I'm not putting down the desire of betterment to be better, to make our lives better. That's not the case. In fact, it's inferred in chapter 6, verse 6. But the good news is that God has brought us a way to be transformed. To deal with this desire of being someone better. God is taking care of that in Christ. I want to be someone better. How does that happen in Christ? I want better stuff. I want to be happy with what I possess, with what I have. How can that happen? Well, it can happen in Christ, who you are and what you have. And when they come together, we are promised there is great gain. Now, there's a problem here. We all understand the problem. We all want great gain, but we often get off the rails in the pursuit of great 
gain. Because of our flesh, because of our sinful nature, we are deceived into thinking that thing over there is going to be really great gain to me. If I get that, if I own that, if I buy that, if I work there, that's my great gain. Well, wrong things, wrong desires, bad things, stupid things, we, we are drawn to that by our sinful nature, by our flesh. The desire for gain is not wrong, but going after the stupid stuff, the bad stuff, the harmful stuff, the destructive stuff, because of our sinful natures, we want great gain to be found in wrong stuff or things. And so what we have here is a biblical prescription of how to have great gain in life, to how to have contentment. Now, I'm not real big on self-help preaching, self-improvement preaching. And I don't think this passage is simply giving us some six steps on how to be a better person or how to be more satisfied in life. But there is in this passage a winning formula, a biblical formula for a good life. God's formula, God's winning formula for life is this, and it's a simple formula. Godliness plus contentment equals great gain. That's biblical math. I am not a mathematical person, but this is a math problem I can get my mind around. In fact, I'll take it even much infinitely further on this. This is an absolute truth. In a world of moral relativism, in a world that eschews absolute truth, this is a take-it-to-the-bank guaranteed kind of truth. There is an equation here of, it's as certain as the equation of what is the one gas you need in life to survive. What's the one gas? Anybody. Oxygen. So pull your mask off because right now you're oxygen deprived. Get a breath and then put it back on. Yeah, that, that is absolutely true. And no amount of moral relativity is going to change that. It, what is the one reality that if you lose your balance or you drop something, what's going to happen? You're going up or down. Come on. You're going down. Why? The law of gravity. The law of gravity. So there is a formula here. Now, this is the interactive part of the sermon. We're going to take a test. Are you ready? Boy, that just was like a lead balloon. Are you ready to take a little test this morning? Okay, so I'm going to throw out some questions here about other ways we've tried to get great gain. And you answer the question, all right? So here we go. Godliness plus wealth and prosperity equals great gain. That's wrong. I've been waiting all morning to do this. Practically every Christian television station has some Yahoo, some man, some woman that gets on there and preaches the prosperity gospel, which is false doctrine. And they preach that Jesus lived and died so that you can have a bigger car, a better house, and more money. That is a lie straight from the pit of hell. And that is not a biblical formula. That does not come from God. Second question, godliness plus poverty or deprivation equals great gain. Now, the reason I'm holding it up here is I was told in the first service they couldn't hear it, so I'm getting it closer to the microphone here. It's not that I'm trying to eat my phone. You're right, false. Some people say, well, it's not the prosperity gospel, so we're going to go clear to the other of the spectrum. Deprivation, poverty, that's the way to godliness. If you really want to walk to God, get rid of everything you own, strip down the bare essentials, and live in abject poverty. No, the Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, as I mentioned last week, I know people that live in poverty that wrestle with covetousness as much as people who have significant resources and money. Third, Godliness plus power or influence equals great gain. True or false? That's right. If you are someone that says, I have to control everything. 
I have to be in charge of everyone all around me in order to be happy, in order to be content. If that's where you are, if everything has to be perfect by your standards, that is a recipe for disaster. That is not great gain to you. If you think my world has to be perfect, I have to be perfect, the people around me have to be perfect, or I, and I'll have great gain, no. It doesn't happen. Here's another one. This one actually stumped the first service. Godliness plus family harmony equals great gain. We will teach and we will work to have families and marriages that are godly, that are Christ-like. And we believe these will facilitate God's blessings in our lives, but you will never have a perfect family. If your expectation is that I'm only going to be happy, that great gain will only come to me in my family as if we're perfect. That is an unrealistic expectation and it is a wrong goal of life. The quest, the goal is not to have a perfect family, it's to have a godly family. And I, I will tell you this, I know my family is not perfect because I'm in it. And I know what I bring to the table. And when I show up, whatever perfection may have been there just completely got corroded because stands in the room. That expectation creates great pains for families every time. And these families, contentment is nowhere to be found in their family. And finally, godliness plus career success equals great gain. True or false? That's right. Okay, my wife is cringing. I'm done. Career success does not in and of itself produce great gain. I have met people, you have too, that have had incredible success in their careers. And they have greater stress, greater hardship, greater pain, greater problems. They are not living great gain lives. There's only one winning formula for great gain. Godliness plus contentment. And when you bring those two together, when they come together on the table, great gain is the promise. Not small gain, not a little bit of gain, not partial gain, great gain, abundant gain, immeasurable gain, gain that is beyond human ability to measure or to value. But in honest assessment, you might be sitting there thinking, you know, I don't have great gain going on. And maybe you're angry or bitter toward God because you're not enjoying a life of contentment with godliness. You don't have great gain. And we judge God harshly because the formula that we have tried to create is not working. And we don't understand why am I discontented and why am I living in fear and why is my life like this way of fear that Stan talks about because we've not embraced God's biblical prescription for a life of great gain so I want to give this morning three principles on breaking the chains of covetousness we talked about this last week and we began to go down that path. I want, I, I want to bring biblical chain cutters into the room. And I want you to take these biblical chain cutters and I want you to ask God to cut the chains to covetousness in your life so that you can be free in great gain. These are the three principles and they're found here in the text. Number one, look to eternity. Look to eternity. Look at verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world... And we can take nothing out. That is an eternal perspective that looks at how I came into this world and how I'm going to leave this world. I'm living my life in terms of an eternal perspective. That what I have, the things I possess and who I am is assessed by not what I have, what I own, what I accumulate, what I earn, where I live and what I drive. 
but in light of eternity. At your death, at my funeral and your funeral, friends and family are going to get together and say, well, what did she leave behind? What did he leave? And the answer will be the same for you and me. The answer will be everything. They left behind every single dime they had, every property they owned, every possession they had. It all got left behind because you leave life with what you brought into it. Keeping God's eternity as our perspective in front of us, keeping that as our perspective in life, helps us pursue great gain of godliness and contentment. Second, let enough be enough. Look at verse 8. Let enough be enough. If we have food and clothing, we will be content. That is, satisfied with God and His sufficient provisions. If we have food and clothing, we will be content. Bottom line living that is victorious living is this. The things you got to have, food and clothing. It says it right there in the Bible. God's inspired, infallible, inerrant word right there. Verse 8. If we have food and clothing... We will be content with these. Now, in my line of work, food and clothing translates into room and board. Talk to our students about tuition and fees and room and board. Board's what you eat. It's our food. That I'm going to need a certain amount of food. In the wilderness wanderings, they kind of got, they said, kind of got burned out on God's supernatural provision of manna. He eventually would bring quail into the mix to add to the menu. But they were not satisfied with that. And they tried to remember the reality that did not exist. Hey, remember in Egypt when we were slaves and we were destitute? We were crying out to God for deliverance because life was hard. Remember that? Yeah, we had a lot, everything we wanted to eat. <laughs> that, that did not match up. The memory did not match up with the reality. When we expect and when we live satisfied with the basics of food, God may surprise us with treats. So to put it kind of glibly, when we're, when we're living and eating this kind of, of a simple diet, we're satisfied with that God may bring a little ice cream to the table every now and then. And Packy's really wanting a little bit of ice cream right now. I can see it in his eyes. You want some ice cream, Packy? You're going to get some ice cream later today? I know. They have this throwdown going on. There's a war under the surface of these men that are losing weight. Packy's about half the man that he used to be. <laughs> There's the issue of room, where we live, covering. Enough clothes and a place to live to shelter us from the storms. We don't have to have closets brimming with clothes for every conceivable thing that are extravagant clothes. We don't have to have immaculate, massive homes. Enough is enough. Let enough be enough. Look to eternity. Let enough be enough. I'm not saying having a large wardrobe or large houses is wrong. I'm not saying that at all. The Bible is saying that the pursuit of such things, the craving of these things, having to have more and more and more, it will not bring contentment. It brings misery and heartache. Pursuing wrong things is like drinking seawater. Have you ever had that experience? Drink a little seawater. You're thirsty all of a sudden for more seawater. You drink a little more seawater. It doesn't help. It hurts. It's destructive. It's a destructive craving. The biblical confession, God, you are enough. I have enough. That's breaking the cycle of pursuing wrong, harmful things. Let enough be enough. Look to eternity. And finally, learn by example. Look at verse 9. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, a snare, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. So again, Paul says, pay attention, look around, and learn the lessons. 
We are not the first people to talk about, to consider matters of contentment. We should pay attention and learn from the examples and words of others. Case in point, John D. Rockefeller at the end of his life. I have made millions, he said, but they have brought me no happiness. Cornelius Vanderbilt, the care of millions is too great a load. There is no pleasure in it. John Jacob Astor, accumulated millions in his lifetime, said, I'm the most miserable man on earth. Henry Ford, at the end of his life, I was happier as a boy working in a mechanic shop, though we had nothing. You know, I, I don't need to go stand on railroad tracks in front of a moving train to know that if I do that, it's going to be painful and maybe even take my life. I have learned from the example of others that have done that, that kind of scenario doesn't end well. We learn some things by example in various areas of our life, do we not? Here's one. Pay attention and learn that those who crave to be rich will fall into a temptation every single time. Guarantee it. And it will become destructive to their lives. In fact, later in verse 9, he describes the destruction. They're going to fall into temptation. Riches bring temptations. And only certain people are able, equipped by God, to handle riches and not succumb to the temptation. Riches allow you to go places you could not go otherwise. They allow you to do things you could not do otherwise. Riches bring experiences that you could not have any other way. And they always bring pressures to sin. And those that don't have them often don't know those kinds of temptations. So those who crave to be rich will fall into temptation. Verse 9, a trap. The pursuit, the craving, the drive, the lust after riches is enslaving. It's a snare. And once you fall into the snare, only God can free you from the trap. Here is the irony of this. It's like, hey, I crave riches. This is the quest of my life. And piece by piece, bar by bar, we create this cell. And we build this trap, this snare, this prison. And then we walk into it and we close the door. And at some point in the cell, we look around. Hey, how did I get in here? How did this happen to me? And we start shaking the bars. We try to get out and we can't get out. God can get you out. God can save you from self-created, self-imposed prisons. The result of an all-consuming pursuit of riches are two. Ongoing temptation that's like drinking seawater. You keep drinking and you keep drinking and it keeps hurting you. And enslavement in prisons of our own making. Living for the pursuit of riches and desires over a lifetime brings damage and devastation to you, to your family, and may have eternal consequences. In Mark chapter 10, we read, Jesus said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. He didn't say rich people cannot enter the kingdom of God, but those who crave riches, who lust after riches, who are driven by the pursuit of riches, they have a struggle. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And when we crave and we, we lust after riches, we are not content. We embrace discontentment. That becomes not only the place of our treasure, but the location of our heart. And one day we may stand before God and when that's been the pursuit of our life and we've abandoned Christ, we, we said no to his gospel and we rejected Jesus, he's going to say, hey, your heart was with your riches. I'm just simply going to send you where your riches are because that's where your heart was always located. Life's losing formulas, verse 10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, back in the day when I was a kid, I heard the saying, money is the root of all evil. That's not what it's saying here. It's saying the love of money is the problem. Money's just currency. It's a commodity. And there are people that are able to manage large chunks and to have large, massive sums of money. And it is just a thing they use to do things. 
The problem arises when we love our money, when we want money, when we pursue money, when money becomes the driving, compelling force that we get out of bed in the morning to go after money. All through the day, we're chasing money. The desires of our heart, more money. And we go to bed at night thinking the last thoughts of what can I do tomorrow to get more money? The love of money is a root of evil, not the only root of evil. All evil is not rooted in love of money, but love of money is always an evil thing. And there are two outcomes that we are told about. For those who are driven by money to be rich at all cost, we are told all kinds of evil happens to those who crave it. And there are two. There are more, but there are two. These singles out. Some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Wandering from the faith. Over the course of my life, I have watched with my own eyes people start their careers and experience some success in that career. And with that success, there begins to be some financial gain. And early on in their young life, they are sincere. They're devout. They're passionate about the Lord. They serve the Lord. They may have even grown up in church. And they started out life, marriage, family down that path. But then they start becoming affluent. And there's the slow drift. They just kind of start moving away. Sundays that were once absolutely committed to worship and meet with God's people now, they've got money to do things on Sunday. It's one day they have an opportunity to do more than they would normally do, and they start spending the money to do that. And they spend waking hours just shopping online. That's all they do. They're on Amazon. They're on this. They're on that. Hour upon hour just perusing and need, that, need to have that. And on it goes. And before long, they, you know, I haven't seen so-and-so in a long time. What happened? I don't know. And then we hear, they, maybe they went to the church across town that doesn't teach Bible doctrine. They're, they don't teach biblical godliness like we do and believe here. So they, they found a church that sort of accommodates their love of money, doesn't make demands upon them like a Bible church might. But even there, they start drifting because they're just drifting. Like wandering in a wilderness. We're told they pierce themselves with many griefs. It's, it's kind of like an, an imaginary dialogue where you meet someone and say, Hey, what are you doing? I'm stabbing myself with these arrows. Why do you keep doing that? Because I love money. The absurdity of that statement only il is illustrated by the, well, the absurdity of it is only undermined by the fact that it happens. We may not say it like that. That's what we're doing. Hey, I love money. Grief, pain, devastation, heartache, misery. Why are you doing that? Because I love me some money. It is a self-imposed, self-inflicted tragedy. Love of money moves us away from Christ and inflicts real harm and damage. And we may look good on the outside. We may look good and fine. But on the inside, we are damaged and devastated on the basis of what we've done to ourselves. So what do we do? Let's talk about moving forward. Let me leave us with three takeaways this morning. Takeaway number one. Say it. I am an advocate of out loud statements, verbal confessions said out loud. And if you are hungry for contentment with godliness to be great gain, sometime, maybe even today, you need to get alone and you need to say two things out loud God, you are enough. I confess it out loud. And God, what you have provided is enough. And you may not even be feeling that way today. 
That may be not where your mind or your heart is intellectually, but by faith, you begin to verbally confess out loud these truths. God, you are enough. God, what you've given is enough. I want great gain the Bible way. Give me godliness and give me contentment. And so in that way, off the way of fear, on the way of faith, I'm saying this out loud. Say it. Say it out loud. The confession of contentment. God, you are enough. God, I have enough too. Seek it. Prayerfully, intentionally take inventory of your life. Here's a little assignment. Check your browsing history. Look at where you're going and where you're spending your online time. If all that is there is shopping stuff, you may need to take a step back and rethink the whole thing. Make your goal to come to the place where you really believe that more does not equal happiness. Acknowledge that you're not going to be happier with more and more. And prayerfully, before God, commit to seek this. And that brings me to number three. Settle it. Say it. Seek it. Settle it. Psalm 62.10 says, If wealth increases... Don't set your heart on it. This requires great steps of faith, deliberate intentionality, where, you know, we kind of just breeze through life with quality of life stuff. Rare is it that someone intentionally says, I am committing, we are committing as a family that we're going to live in this size house, nothing smaller, nothing bigger, we're going to drive this kind of car. We're going to live this kind of lifestyle. We're going to wear these kinds of clothes. We're going to live within our means. If God increases that, we might make some adjustments here and there. But we're going to be intentional about it. We're going to settle that wealth is not going to take over our heart. That we're going to commit to pursue a lifestyle pleasing to God of contentment. You need to pick the lifestyle that best serves God in your particular situation. And your decisions in this will not be mine and mine will not be yours. But do not compromise those commitments when the windfall of income increases come your way. Be counterculture and radically nonconformly, nonconforming and live a biblically modest lifestyle. Learn the principle that enough is enough. So, I have been forewarned in times of transition and trial, there will come a temptation to covet. It's going to happen. Pay attention, Stan. It will happen to me. It will happen to you. Before the temptation comes, I need to be intentional in saying, seeking, and settling this matter today. I want to live in the land of contentment, the promised land, the way of faith. That's where I want to live because there is the kind of great gain that my heart yearns to have, and I will only have it God's way. I'm going to be dealing with God about this today, and have been. I want to challenge you to join me in getting this settled in your heart as God leads today. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I'm learning that the older I get, the less satisfying stuff and money really is, if it ever was at all. And, and I want to be contented. I, I want biblical great gain. Let me find, let us find the joy of a walk on a cool afternoon the joy and contentment of a conversation with our family, 
of watching a summer sunset, of enjoying an evening with good friends, the simplicity of prayer, the simplicity of spiritual disciplines. Teach me to enjoy simple pleasures. Teach me, teach us biblical contentment. Help us to be mindful of the temptations that will come to covet, the temptation to complain, and help us to overcome these temptations with the way of escape that you've given to us with gratitude and with biblical contentment. I want to live in the land of great gain, but I want to be in the right land the right way. And in your son, we will find that. Draw us into his life and let us enjoy the promised life, the abundant life that he gives to us who follow him. We ask this and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Appreciate it. Word from Dr. Uh, Norman today. Hey, a couple things and uh, we'll be dismissed. Uh, you've heard us for the past several weeks uh, mentioning uh, marriage night to you uh, and uh, and all the things that are going to come with that. And uh, our marriage night is actually a marriage day, but marriage night is the official, official title. And that's a virtual marriage conference. We would love to be able to do a uh, a different style of marriage conference, and perhaps next year we can uh, we can look at that. Uh, but it'll take place in this room right here. And so, uh, if you're uh, married, uh, we would love to have you uh, engaged in that. Uh, just the other day, Paige and I were talking about ten years ago. Uh, we were at a marriage conference uh, in Cabot, Arkansas, uh, with uh, the church we were on staff at the time. We taken several um, married couples and and go up into that. And so, I just want to encourage you if you've never had an opportunity to, to attend a marriage conference. Uh, they are wonderful. And you might say, well, my marriage is perfect. Then you should teach this conference for us uh, and we could all learn. <laughs> but I would think uh, as we all kind of subtly laugh, uh, not too loud with our spouses nearby, that all of our marriages have troubles and trials and uh, and uh, we could all seek uh, t- uh, to find some improvements in there. So we would encourage you to come and participate and uh, to be a part of that. Hey, the fall is a great opportunity in the life of churches to kind of get back in the rhythm and routine. Kids are going back to school. Uh, our summer travel schedules typically get, get lighter and more home more and stuff like that. And so as we get back in this rhythm and routine, um, our staff desires that that church become a part of your rhythm and routine. And so uh, if you're able... And, and your health allows, we would we would encourage you, those of you sitting in this room are doing this, for those of you watching online or those of you watching on Channel 6, uh, that we would love to see you back in this building. And we know that for, for some health conditions uh, prevent you from doing that, and we certainly understand and acknowledge that. Um, but, uh, but if you're able, man, we'd love to see you again. Uh, we really would. And uh, we miss you. Uh, there's folks every single week when we have our staff meeting, there are people that I think God brings to different staff members' minds. Hey, have you seen or heard from, from so-and-so or this family or that family? And, and some folks, uh, there's a handful of folks I've not seen since March, uh, physically seen anywhere in any capacity in six months. That's a long time. Um, and, uh, and stuff like that. So we'd love to see you. We'd love to uh, have you be part. We're doing all we can here to, to, uh, uh, t- to make this as safe as campus as we can be. Uh, so if you're able, man, we'd love to, uh, to, to see you and, and have you be part of a uh, church, be part of your routine again. In connection with that, uh, our connect groups mostly have all come back uh, to meeting um, uh, physically together. And there's a couple that haven't. And starting September 13th, all of our connect group classes, all of our adult classes and our kids' classes uh, will come back online and start meeting again physically in person. And uh, so we want you to be a part of that. Uh, again, if it's safe and, and if, if your health doesn't prevent you from doing that, uh, but we would love for you to be a part um, uh, of a connect group. And we're excited about our kids' ministry connect group starting back. They've not had a chance to meet since September 3rd or September 13th. They've not had a chance to meet since March. Uh, it's been a long time since our children have had an opportunity to meet. So they're going to meet upstairs in their rooms. Holly has protocols in place. We've, we've, we're doing things a little different uh, in order to distance the kids and all the stuff. But she's been working up here, her and Charlton have been working for, for weeks uh, preparing uh, that space for our kids. And so we're trying to make that as safe as possible. So we're excited about that. Their connect group for kids will be on Sunday evenings at 6. 
our student ministry will be on Sunday evening at 6, just at our other campus. And um, so anyway, we hope and pray that Connect Groups will, will come back into your life and be a part of your life. Uh, last thing is this, uh, what happens, first service this morning was sold out, in fact, uh, we had to break out a few more chairs to, to create enough space. You might say, well, what happens? Everybody wants us to come back, and there's only 130 seats in here. What happens if we sell it out? We'll do a third service, uh, and we'll, we'll tweak some times, and we'll just do another service. What happens if it sells that out? Stan will preach a fourth time. He'll love that. Uh, and, uh, no, and uh, no, but I was here. We'll, we'll make a way. So don't, don't you feel like, well, I don't want to take somebody to see you come back. And we'll, we'll provide a way. We'll create. Our staff's already worked on this. Uh, we started working on this months ago. So we've got plans in place. And so if the Lord fills this building first service and the Lord fills a second, then we'll do a third. And then we'll figure things out. Uh, post, uh, post a third. But we want you here. We want you to be a part of what God's doing here in Lime Park Church. So.